Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're gonna be introducing to you guys the other major type of statistical inference that we're gonna be covering for the remainder of our semester. In the previous set of videos, we introduced you guys to the concept of a hypothesis test, which we saw was basically a statistical procedure that's used to determine if a sample or several samples uh, basically provide evidence for a particular claim. In what we're going to be doing in today's video, we're going to be studying a different concept, which is called a confidence interval. And basically, in general, a confidence interval isn't about finding evidence. It's actually a way of making a statistical estimation. So in general, a confidence interval is a statistical estimation technique used to estimate a population parameter. Population parameter just means some property of a overall population. For our class, the two parameters we're going to be interested in estimating are either going to be average when we're studying something quantitative or percentages when we're studying something categorical. We won't get to the categorical stuff though for a little bit. So for right now, everything's going to be about estimating an average. So in general, uh, confidence intervals are a two-step process. As we saw, hypothesis tests are always a five-step process, but confidence intervals are a little bit shorter. They're only a two-step process. So the first step of sort of constructing or building a confidence interval is always a set of conditions. This is very similar to how there were conditions for the hypothesis test. In the hypothesis test case, if those conditions weren't met, then the results of the hypothesis test were not valid. It's the same thing here. If the conditions for a confidence interval are not met, then the results of the confidence interval cannot be considered a valid estimate for the population parameter. So there'll always be a set of conditions that we need to confirm. The second step is the construction of the actual confidence interval. And the construction, even though the actual formula will change, like what values we sort of plug in, it'll always sort of follow a single format. And that single format is that there will be a point estimate plus or minus a margin of error. And you can see how if you take a value and you both subtract and add something else, that's going to build you a range because the point estimate minus the margin of error is going to give you the low end of your interval and the point estimate plus the margin of error is going to give you the high end of your interval. So what are these components? So what are the point estimate and the margin of error? Well, the point estimate is our guess for whatever parameter we're trying to estimate based on our sample. So in other words, we're going to take the information we have from our sample and use that to make a guess for what's true in the population. That's going to be what we call the point estimate. Obviously, though, since our sample is only a small slice of the population, we can't expect that the average or the percentage in our sample is going to exactly match what's true in the population. So while that's a good starting place, that point estimate, we're then going to widen it by the margin of error. So the margin of error basically widens our guess into an interval that we can be reasonably confident will contain the desired population parameter. So in other words, what we're basically doing is we're using the point estimate as our sort of guess, and then we're using that margin of error to give ourselves some room on both sides of that guess to have a better uh, overall confidence in catching the sort of population parameter. Now, I would like to make a couple quick notes in general about confidence and confidence intervals before we get to sort of seeing the first confidence interval that we're going to learn how to build. So these are general notes that apply about confidence in any situation. So the first is that the term confidence is not the same as probability. Um, it probably seems like from just like an English standpoint that confidence and probability are similar. They, they are similar, but mathematically they're, they're, they should be viewed as distinct things. So when discussing a confidence interval, we are always careful to use the language of confidence and avoid the language of chance or probability. And this is because mathematically sort of behind the scenes, Probability is the terminology used for things that have not happened yet, while confidence is the language used for things that have happened, but we don't know the result of. So to sort of explain this a little bit more, I want to give you guys just sort of a little thought experiment. Imagine that you have a coin and you're going to flip that coin. If we're going to talk about what is the probability that it'll come up heads. That would be the correct terminology because you have the coin, you haven't flipped it yet, and you would want to know the probability that once you do flip it, it comes up heads. Now, you should compare that to the idea that you flipped the coin, caught it, but you haven't seen the result. 
At that point, you would start to use the language of confidence. You would say you are 50% confident that the coin is heads. It doesn't make sense to talk about probability because the coin either is heads or is tails. You just don't know the result. So in that situation, you would start to use the language of confidence because the result is there. You just don't know what it is. You can also sort of keep in mind that confidence is basically how we how sure we are in the method that we used to build our estimation. All right. The second sort of comment that I want to make, which actually is more sort of computational in nature, is that there is a direct relationship between confidence and margin of error for all confidence intervals. As you raise your confidence level, the margin of error also naturally increases. In other words, to be more confident in our estimation, we have to give ourselves a wider interval that we consider believable. And this right here is actually one of the challenges in building a confidence interval. Again, I want to give you guys sort of a little thought experiment to think about that. Imagine you had to guess somebody's age. Would you feel more confident if you had to make that guess to within one year of what was true or to within 50 years of what was true? If you think about that, it should be very clear that you'd be way more confident if you got to have a margin of error of like 50 some years, right? Now you could just guess the person was 50 years old, plus or minus 50, that's they're somewhere between zero and 100 years old. You would be very comfortable sort of making that guess. Now, if you only had to guess their age to within one year, that would be a lot harder, right? Because you'd have to be within one year of what's correct. So this is what we mean by the idea that as we raise our confidence level, we have to give ourselves more of a margin of error so that we can have that extra confidence. Now, the downside is if you were to go back and tell somebody, hey, I know that this person is somewhere between zero and 100 years old, that's not particularly useful. You would be very confident about it, but you wouldn't be particularly useful because it's not precise. So this sort of second comment, the real deep meaning behind this, is that there's sort of a give and take between being confident in our estimate and our estimate being sort of useful and precise. And unfortunately, if we want one, we have to sort of sacrifice the other. It turns out mathematically that the only way that we can improve both our confidence and our precision is, of course, by having more data. Okay, so these are just some general comments about confidence. Now it's time to actually talk about the first type of confidence interval that we're going to build. So let's go ahead and talk about that. All right, so the name of the first confidence interval that we're going to discuss in this class is what's called the one sample mean confidence interval. Now, you should immediately, as soon as you see that, sort of realize that that's a very similar name to the first hypothesis test that we learned, right? The first hypothesis test we learned was the one sample mean hypothesis test. Well, you can sort of think about this as the corresponding confidence interval. This is the confidence interval you would use for the same sort of data. So this confidence interval is used when you have one sample of quantitative data, exactly the same as when we did the one sample mean hypothesis test. And our goal is to estimate an unknown population average. So the one sample mean confidence interval basically is where you have one sample of quantitative data and you want to estimate an unknown population average. Let's talk about the two steps of this confidence interval. So first, the conditions. The conditions, there's three of them. They should look very familiar. Uh, the first is that the data has to be random and representative. The second is that the sample size has to be less than 5% of the population size. And the third is that the data has to be either approximately normal or the sample size has to be greater than or equal to 30. Now, if you look at these three conditions, these are actually the exact same conditions as the one sample mean hypothesis test. So if you think about this, this is saying that the exact same things have to be true for you to run the one sample mean hypothesis test and the one sample mean confidence interval. What that also tells you guys is that if you ever run a hypothesis test and then you want to follow up with a confidence interval, that's a very common thing to do in statistics because if in our hypothesis test we find evidence that the average has increased or decreased or changed, the natural sort of follow-up question is, well, what's the new average? And the confidence interval would do that for you. So if you ever need to do a confidence interval as a follow-up to a hypothesis test, you won't need to check these conditions because they're the exact same. 
All right, let's talk about the construction. So the formula for the construction is that we're gonna use X bar as our point estimate. So this thing right here, this is your point estimate. And this guy right here, this T star S divided by square root of M, this is your margin of error, which we'll often abbreviate as the MOE. All right, most of these sort of variables you guys should be pretty comfortable with. We know X bar, that's your sample average. We know S is your sample standard deviation. We know N is your sample size. The only one that might be a little bit foreign to us is this T star. So let's talk about that. So T star, it comes from table C. We know that that should make sense because in general, table C is the table that tells us about how the T distribution works. So T star is related to that. To look that up, what you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to find your confidence level, which is basically how confident you want to be, and you're gonna intersect that with your degrees of freedom, which is still gonna be N minus one. You're gonna put those two together, and that is gonna help you find your T star. So you'll find your confidence level, you'll find your degrees of freedom, intersect those, and find your T star. Real quick, I just want to go ahead and show you guys the table so that you can see where the confidence levels are listed. If you look at table C here, the confidence levels are across the top. So if you want to say be 95% confident, you would start here, you'd find your degrees of freedom here and intersect in here to be your T star. Okay, so let's go back. And now we know how both the conditions and how to construct this. We got one important note to sort of mention here before we get into our examples. So the important note that I wanna mention is that confidence intervals for averages, which is what this one is, it's trying to estimate an unknown average, apply to the population, not to individuals. The concept of an average doesn't apply to individuals, right? Each individual has an individual value. They don't have an average value. So one thing that's really important here is that you have to realize that what we're trying to do in this construction is estimate the average of our population. So our results, unfortunately, do not apply to individuals from our population. And as we start to do our examples, we'll see exactly what that means there. Okay, so let's get into taking a look 